Um, so I'm not going to talk about the present very much. Um, but I do want to mention, of course, that as we know, AI is making a lot of progress. Uh, I'm sure many of you have seen this graph showing the rate of improvement uh, in object recognition. This is on the ImageNet task where uh, machine learning systems have now, uh, in many practical senses, exceeded human capabilities for recognizing a large number of fine-grained object categories and images. You've probably also seen Lee Sedol uh, worrying about losing his game uh, against AlphaGo. Um, so these are very exciting times. I just want to show you a little bit from Peter Abiel's lab. Uh, this is my colleague Peter. And this is our robot Brett. And uh, Brett has to do the laundry. Um, and just to show you how fast things are moving, Brett will be actually in a museum next year uh, at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. There's a three-month exhibition on the future. Uh, and Brett will be one of the centerpieces of their exhibition. Uh, and hopefully, he'll be folding laundry for three months uh, if, we can, if we can get him to work for that long. Um, and people can just give him laundry to fold at the museum, and he'll fold it. So um, let me talk about something else. So I'm sure you're all uh, up to the eyeballs in deep learning. I wanted to talk about another approach to AI, uh, which is also making a lot of progress, and that's parabolistic programming. So a parabolistic programming program is uh, if you like, a Bayes' nets on steroids. So it's a way of writing probability models using uh, not a circuit language, which Bayes' nets and, uh, and deep learning are. These are circuit languages. Uh, this is a Turing equivalent language. Uh, so it gives you the full expressive power of first order logic or, or a regular programming language, but you're writing a probability model directly. Uh, and um, in our language, which is called Bayesian logic, or BLOG for short, uh, you can show that every well-formed program, programs that don't, uh, in some sense, have uh, infinite loops in them, uh, defines a proper distribution over the variables of interest. And then we can write general purpose inference algorithms that, uh, that do inference correctly and converge in the limit for any program that you can write in the language. So for those of you who do de deep, deep learning, you can think of this as, uh, as a dynamically generated uh, deep learning uh, uh, generative model. Um, and so in the example I'm about to show you, uh, the, uh, the programming system generates on the fly uh, networks with up to several million variables. But the structure of the network can change as the inference proceeds, and the number of variables can change as the inference proceeds. So it's a much more flexible and general way of building machine learning systems. Um, so here's the application that we developed over the last few years. Uh, this, is a, um, this is the result of a small nuclear test that took place in Nevada uh, a few decades ago. The biggest nuclear test was about 500 times the size of this. Uh, and just to give you a quantitative number, this test ejected 12 million tons of earth and rock uh, into the atmosphere. So um, nuclear testing has been going on since uh, 1945. There have been over 2,000 nuclear tests. Uh, and the tests themselves, not the, not the ones in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but just the tests, have killed over 100,000 people uh, because of the amount of fallout that they produced. Um, and they also, of course, facilitate uh, having a nuclear arms race. So there's an organization, the United Nations has the uh, organization called the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty Organization or the CTBTO. Um, and they're, they're the guardians of the treaty. Uh, and one of their jobs is to make sure that nobody is testing nuclear weapons anywhere on the Earth. Um, so if you think about that problem, right, in, in the standard Bayesian way, you have to have evidence, you have to have a model, uh, and then you have to have uh, some inference happening. So the evidence is collected from uh, about 150 seismic stations, which are scattered all over the world called the International Monitoring System. And uh, that looks like this. So those typical wiggly lines that seismogra seism seismograms uh, describe the, the minute vibrations of the Earth when seismic events take place. Um, the query is, what happened? So every 24 hours, we have to produce a bulletin saying these are all the seismic events that took place anywhere in the world. These are the ones that are suspicious because they took place sufficiently close to the surface 
uh, and they're not explained by natural seismicity. Um, and then the model is uh, everything we know about geophysics. So where do natural events occur? Uh, how are signals transmitted from natural events? Uh, how do the detectors work? What's the, what's the noise uh, that's corrupting the signal and so on? So, um, so that's the seismic monitoring problem. Um, this is the blog program that describes that problem. So this contains all of the relevant geophysics um, in order to, to build the system. This is called the NetVisa model uh, for uninteresting reasons. Uh, but the point is that this is quite short, so it's relatively straightforward in this language to write models that generate millions of random variables um, using a fairly short uh, piece of code. Uh, and just to show you some results, um, when we run this model, so we take all that seismic data uh, and we combine it with this model, we run inference using MCMC. Um, this is the current performance of the, the previous United Nations system. So this is the uh, on the y-axis is the fraction of the events that the system fails to detect. So obviously higher is worse, and you can see that uh, at different magnitude ranges, the failure rates are between 30 and 50 percent. Um, and this is the results from NetVisa. So we've reduced the error rate by fr a factor of two to three. Um, this shows uh, that we're also getting better locations. So this is the 2013 test in North Korea. Uh, the black uh, the black cross near the bottom is where, where the tunnel is, which we can find from satellite photographs. So the actual explosion took place near there. The blue square is the location that our system produced. And the green triangle on the top left is, uh, that's the combined expertise of all of the human geophysical experts and, uh, and detection systems in the world. Uh, and our system, with, completely unaided, uh, got a better location. And just recently, we've shown that with a, a somewhat more sophisticated model, uh, we can actually uh, increase the detection rate by a factor of 10 uh, compared to the best human experts combined with, the, um, with their software. So this is the same raw input data with a factor of 10 improvement uh, on the detection rate. So uh, just what this is serve, serves you as a reminder that there are things going on in AI besides deep learning. Uh, and that the ability to express knowledge and combine knowledge with data is actually much more effective uh, than uh, just using tabula rasa machine learning in many cases. So, um, just to take stock of where we are now, uh, Andrew Ng um, from Baidu, used to be in my group, uh, has, uh, I think, a reasonable characterization of what we can do. Anything that takes a human being one second or less uh, is a pretty good candidate uh, for machine learning to be doing uh, approximately as well or better than a human. Uh, we have some really cool toys. We have uh, legged robots. We have flying robots. We have self-driving cars. Uh, we have perception, navigation working pretty well. Um, so when I compare the situation today uh, to even 10 years ago, things are looking uh, really much further along than most people would have expected. Uh, there's a lot still to do. So despite uh, many claims that we can do captioning and, uh, and that we can do machine translation and so on, there certainly is progress there. But I wouldn't say at, at, the, at the moment that we have real understanding of language in terms of the ability to extract information and then reason with it, uh, combining information, for example, from multiple different documents uh, to answer complex questions and so on. That, that capability is simply not there. Um, as I mentioned, the ability to combine learning with knowledge uh, doesn't really exist in the deep learning connection. And if you think about it right, if you're, if you, let's say you're, you're doing deep learning to recognize objects in images. Well, the output of the, the deep learning system on an image is a discrete logical category. This is a cat, right? This is a Doberman pincher. Well, if you don't have any way of using that information, uh, then what's the point of generating it, right? So there's actually a mismatch between uh, what deep learning systems can take as input and what they produce as output. Uh, and so there's still, I think, a lot of work to be done on understanding the integration uh, of these machine learning systems with systems for reasoning uh, and combining information from multiple sources. Uh, probably the biggest thing that's missing is cumulative uh, discovery, whether it's of concepts or theories, or in particular, high-level actions. So the ability that humans have 
to reason at many scales of abstraction uh, is what lets you come to this meeting, right? In this meeting, over the course of three days, you will do several billion primitive physical actions. And yet you're able to reason uh, at the scale of, oh, I'm going to go to AI by the bay, right? Even though that's several billion actions, poor little AlphaGo can only look ahead 25 or 30 actions, right? So there's, a, again, a huge mismatch between our understanding of how to do look ahead uh, planning uh, and what humans are able to do because we have the ability to operate at multiple scales of abstraction. Uh, and that's probably, to me, the biggest missing thing uh, is how do we get machines to create those levels of abstraction so that they can reason over long time scales uh, and be effective in the real world. If we solve these problems, then I think we are a long way to having human level AI. So let's assume that we solve those problems, right? Let's assume that we don't just fail. What does that mean? It means that eventually we'll have systems that are better than us. And better means that uh, for almost any decision in the real world, they'll be able to use more information, look further ahead, and produce a better decision. What does that mean? Well, it means a lot. Uh, it doesn't just mean you know, so cars having fewer accidents or medical systems making fewer errors or you know, better fraud detection. Those things are all cool. Um, but if you remember that everything, our, our entire civilization is the result of what's up here, right? We don't have big claws or scary teeth. Um, we have brains. And our civilization is a result of the amount of intelligence that we have. So if you have access to a lot more, then uh, that has to be a step change in our civilization. So this is not just small incremental improvements in our standard of living or the efficiency of industrial and commercial processes. This is something that we will look back on uh, in the future as a major turning point in the history of the human race. So we have to make sure that turning point goes well. And we can already see some downsides. Uh, killer robots are um, already a serious problem. There are countries who are already developing and deploying uh, robots that can choose who to kill, where, where to go, and when to kill. These are not uh, science fiction uh, imagination. This is, this is real. Um, and the United Nations has a process underway to develop a treaty. Um, but at the moment, the United States is not supporting that process. Uh, so we have to be considering whether this is a good idea. Uh, another topic that I'm not going to talk about is the predictions that we are seeing uh, of massive disruptions in employment, which could have huge social consequences. But here's what I want to talk about. Since it's a nice sunny morning, we'll have a nice cheerful topic, the end, the end of the human race. Um, and so we've heard a lot of speculation from various people about uh, the end of the human race. And many of you probably think, this, right? That the people who are making these speculations, well, they don't know anything about AI. They're not even real scientists, right? They're just people who like to spout off in the press. Um, so here's a little quote. If a machine can think, it might think more intelligently than we do. And then where should we be? Even if we could keep the machines in a subservient position, for instance, by turning off the power at strategic moments, we should, as a species, feel greatly humbled. And this new danger is certainly something which can give us anxiety. So anyone know who said this? This is Alan Turing. So this, this idea is, is actually probably not that unfamiliar to you. The, the idea that if you make something more intelligent than you are, that there's a certain unease that you might be uh, in trouble as a species. And you could ask the gorillas. The gorillas are having a meeting to discuss whether they should have created the human race seven million years ago or whenever it was we branched off from the evolutionary tree. Right? Was it a good idea? And they're having this meeting. You can see they're pretty unhappy about it. And they decided no. It was a really bad idea for them as a species to create the humans uh, because now the gorillas have no control over their future whatsoever. Uh, and they really only survive uh, because some of us are reasonably generous towards them, and some aren't. Um, but this is a bit 
of an inchoate fear. It's hard to really do anything practical uh, to ward off this future um, without understanding more precisely what the problem is. So you have to say, what is really bad about better AI? Right? It has all this great upside. What's, what is the reason why uh, we might have a problem? So here's another quote. If we use to achieve our purposes a mechanical agency with whose operation we cannot interfere effectively, we had better be quite sure that the purpose put into the machine is the purpose which we really desire. Anyone know who said this? So this is Norbert Wiener, who's the father of modern control theory and automation, uh, professor at MIT, and wrote this in 1960, uh, actually having just seen Arthur Samuel's checker-playing program uh, beat its creator and beat several other uh, fairly competent checker-playing people. And, um, but you could say the same thing uh, could have been written by, by King Midas. Right? So, so the, this idea that uh, getting exactly what you say you want can be a terrible thing right, goes back a long way in human history. And it actually appears in many different cultures uh, with legends and myths uh, you know, the whole idea of the genie is always that the third wish is please undo the first two wishes, right? But uh, with AI, you may not have the ability to just reverse what you asked for uh, in the first place. So te technically, this is now called value misalignment, right? It's a misalignment between what you really care about uh, and the value or the objective that you put into the machine uh, to achieve on your behalf. And um, the problem is we don't, have a good, we don't have a scientific discipline whose job it is to figure out what the objective should be for the AI system. So all of the disciplines that deal with optimization of objectives uh, assume that the objective just comes from someone else. Right? It's just plugged in exogenously. Uh, and then the, the job of our discipline is to figure out how to achieve it, how to optimize it. Um, and there li therein lies the problem, right? that if it's the wrong objective, then you have a mess. Now, um, how big a mess was pointed out by Steve Omohundro um, back around 2000 in a paper called The Basic AI Drives. So he said, look, if you take any goal, even something as simple as fetch the coffee, then uh, any sufficiently intelligent machine realizes that if someone switches it off, it will not be able to fetch the coffee. So as a sub-goal of any objective you give to a machine, uh, self-preservation is required. So this is not something that you build in to the machine. This is something that automatically follows from giving the machine any objective whatsoever. Similarly, uh, the need to acquire more resources. So you can increase the probability of achieving the objective if you acquire more resources. So think of the objective of curing cancer. If you tell a machine, could you please come up with a cure for cancer? Then it has an incentive now to acquire all the financial resources on the Earth and actually to use all the human beings on the Earth as guinea pigs to, to, uh, to get that uh, slightly increased probability of finding a cure uh, and doing so more quickly. So if you take that, right, take these, these natural consequences of an objective, uh, and then you have an objective which is misaligned with what you really want. Right now you're setting up a kind of a, a chess match or a go match between the human race uh, and the machine, uh, which you think is doing your bidding, but in fact is doing something uh, that you don't quite want. Um, and we, we may not win that chess match. So that's, that's the premise of 2001 A Space Odyssey. Right, where, in fact, the objective of HAL and the objective of the, of the two humans is mismatched. Uh, in fact, the humans don't really know what HAL's true objective is. Um, and that's why, early on in the movie, they have HAL playing a, ch a chess match with Dave. Uh, and it's pretty clear that HAL can you know, outthink Dave uh, you know, without, without even opening one of his eyes. So, um, so th this is the issue that we face. And yet, oddly enough, um, there are a lot of people in AI who prefer simply not to face the issue. Uh, and they will trot out all kinds of reasons why we shouldn't pay attention. So I've come up with a list of about 20. Um, and they all share this flavor that 
uh, they can't possibly really believe these reasons because they just don't hold water. Um, so I suspect there's some kind of cognitive process going on of a sort of self-defense. Look, I, I do AI. You know, if you say anything bad about AI, then you're attacking me and my research, and, and so it must be wrong, right? Uh, but this is not anti-AI any more than pointing out that you know, nuclear weapons are dangerous is anti-physics. It's not anti-physics. It's actually a complement to physics that they can actually have an impact on the real world because, because the physics is right. right. And the same with AI. We've been wrong, or at least ineffective, for most of the history of the field. So no one cared because our AI systems are too stupid. Now they're starting to show signs that they might be capable of impacting the world on a larger scale. Uh, that we should take this as a compliment, but we should also take it seriously. So what are some of these reasons? I'm not going to go through all 20. Um, but one of the ones you see, oddly enough, coming from AI people is, well, I know I've been saying for 60 years that we will, of course, achieve human-level AI, uh, but now that it's starting to happen, no, we won't. Right? This is a very strange uh, response, but you see it quite a lot, including uh, the recent AI 100 report, which is supposed to represent the, the sort of accumulated wisdom of the field about how things are going to go in the future, they literally claim that achieving human-level AI is, is impossible as a way of deflecting any notion that it might present a risk. Let me give you a little history lesson. Anyone know who this is? This is Ernest Rutherford. So Ernest Rutherford was probably the most famous nuclear scientist of his day. He was the man who split the atom um, back in the early part of the 20th century. And on September 11th, 1933, he made a very, very definitive prediction that we would never, ever be able to extract the nuclear energy that we knew to exist within the atom. That was September 11th. Um, this is Leo Zillard. He read that in the Times the next morning, uh, and he went out and invented the neutron-induced nuclear chain reaction. So that was less than 24 hours later. The key problem uh, that was preventing us from creating nuclear power and nuclear weapons was solved. And he patented, within a year, he patented a nuclear reactor, uh, had an idea about how you could create a nuclear weapon. Uh, and the first patent on a nuclear weapon was 1939 uh, by the French, oddly enough, not by the Americans or the British, but by the French. Um, so things can change. So, so predicting that uh, humans are too stupid to make the progress that we need to reach human-level AI is a really bad idea. There's a bunch of other reasons. I just want to mention one more. You can read these as they go by. Um, Here's another one you might see. Don't mention these risks uh, because it might be bad for funding. So this is also a bad strategy, right? The nuclear power industry adopted this strategy, right? There are no risks. We'll have clean, free electrical energy for the rest of time. You know, we can get rid of all that's coal and oil and everything else. Uh, and then they had Chernobyl, right? And that was the end of the nuclear power industry uh, when, when the nuclear reactor really did melt down and explode. Um, so avoiding risks or trying to pretend they don't exist is a bad strategy for your own industry, for your own research area. Face up to them uh, and see if we can solve them. OK, so let's assume that you agree with me. Uh, what are we going to do about it? Um, so we have a new center called the Center for Human Compatible AI, which is a deliberately rude title to the rest of the field. Um, and our goal is to actually change the way we think about AI away from this idea that we should simply optimize objectives uh, and towards the idea that we should make the systems provably beneficial. So whatever the human's objective really is, it had better be the case that the machine that you give to the human race is actually going to be beneficial to them. Uh, there's a lot of organizations uh, currently at work on the, something like this agenda, including many of the funding agencies and professional societies. So what we're going to try to do is shift, as I said, from optimizing the objective to making sure humans are happy with the results. And there are three simple ideas for how we're going to do this. The first one is that 
So think of this, think of a human and a robot, all right? You can think of all robots and all humans, but just think of this as simple. There's one human, one robot. The robot's objective is to make the human happy, right? But as we point out, the human can't easily tell the robot the full objective. The human can't list out all the things that they could ever possibly care about. So that means the robot does not really know what the human objective is. And this, this kind of humility is crucial to having systems that are proven to be beneficial. Um, the third point is that there is a source of information about human values, and that's human behavior. That our actions, our choices, reveal what we really want, uh, at least to the extent that our limited cognitive architectures allow us to, uh, to realize those, uh, those objectives. So the process of value alignment, then, uh, can be related to a field called inverse reinforcement learning, which is about 20 years old. Uh, it's the inverse of reinforcement learning. So reinforcement learning, you have, um, you have an objective which you give to the machine in the form of rewards, uh, and then the machine has to learn the behavior that optimizes uh, the rewards. Inverse reinforcement learning is the other way around. You observe a behavior, and you have to figure out what reward system is optimized by this behavior, okay? So that's the, that's the basic task that we face, is how do we do inverse reinforcement learning with the human race as the source of the behavior? Um, and the goal is for the machines to understand enough about our values to behave uh, in ways that make us happy. There's a slight variant on this which we actually need because it's not a passive process of observation, it's an active process of cooperation. So humans and robots actually are involved in a multiplayer game. Uh, and this is inevitable, actually, that we need this as a theoretical foundation. Uh, and in this game, the human knows the value function in the sense that they approximately behave according to it, but the robot doesn't know what the value function is uh, and has to maximize it. So that's the game. And when you solve this game, you find out that indeed the human and the robot do cooperate. The human will actually teach the robot so that the robot can be useful to the human, uh, and everything works out as you hope, and you do in fact get provably beneficial systems. So let me give you a simple example. So I mentioned this point that you can't fetch the coffee if you're dead. Okay, so that means that a robot that's told to fetch the coffee uh, will, for example, uh, eliminate all the other people in Starbucks just in case they might switch it off. So you wouldn't, you wouldn't want this. Right? You'd want to be able to switch the robot off uh, if you felt that the robot was doing something wrong. So we seem to be facing a sort of a, a contradiction. Right? We, we've just argued that the robot's not going to let you switch it off, but you want uh, to have the ability to switch it off so that in case it's doing something you don't like. So how do, we, how do we fix this problem? The answer is if the robot is uncertain about the true objective. So it may know that you want coffee, but it, doesn't, it knows that it doesn't know uh, all the trade-offs involved, how much you might be willing to pay, uh, you know, what it costs to eliminate other people in Starbucks, uh, and so on. So there's a lot that the robot knows that it doesn't know about the objective. And it's precisely this uncertainty about the objective that allows uh, you to have control over the robot. Because the robot reasons to itself, okay, why would the human switch me off? Well, it's because I must be doing something it doesn't like. But my objective is only to do things that the human likes. So by allowing the human to switch me off, I am actually benefiting the human. Okay? If the robot knows for sure what the objective is, then it doesn't let you switch it off. So it's uncertainty that provides this kind of safety margin. And you can prove this as a mathematical theorem that it's in the robot's interest to allow you to switch it off. Um, and then when you have that, you have a provably beneficial robot. So this notion of uncertainty in objectives is really I think central to how we should move the field forward in the future to build systems that are provably beneficial. And I'm getting the evil eye from my timekeeper. Um, so I'm going to skip over some of these slides. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm not going to talk about wire heading, which is where people who have wires uh, directly stimulating their reward center in their brain will actually continually uh, stimulate the reward center until they die of starvation. Um, so, uh, and then we show how to, how to actually solve that problem so that robots don't do that to you. And, um, okay, skipping over this. So, this is a big project, right? This is not something that we, you know, we 
we can just set up uh, you know, a TensorFlow system and collect a bunch of human behavior data and shove it all in. Uh, there's a lot of complications to this. The go on the good side, there's a huge amount of information, right? We have big data about human behavior because everything the human race has ever written down, uh, every movie we've ever made, every television program is really about people doing stuff. So there's a huge amount of data about people doing stuff. That's good. Um, there's a very strong incentive to get it right because if you get it wrong, uh, you have these very unpleasant consequences in the near term, right? We don't have to wait to, until we have superintelligence to see the downside of getting this wrong. So Google got it wrong because they specified uh, in the loss matrix for their photo classification algorithms, they specified uniform costs for every misclassification. Uh, and that's an incorrect specification of the cost of misclassifying a human as a gorilla. So when you get the costs wrong, you make mistakes. Um, so we can have a little story about the robot that has to feed the kids and there's no food in the fridge and it sees the cat. And then this is the headline. And then that's the end of the domestic robot industry. <laughs> right? So, so one, one even moderate, you know, moderately serious mistake uh, about what the human value function is uh, could lead to the end of your industry. Okay, so there's a strong incentive to get it right. Unfortunately, there's a lot of difficulties, uh, which mean we have to work hard. Uh, and those difficulties have to do with humans, right? That we are much more complicated uh, than just a simple optimizer. If we were simple optimizers, we'd all be fine, right? But we're not. We are, we are far uh, short of behaving optimally in any reasonable sense, right? We have all these complicated characteristics, and we have to invert the human behavior that we see, we have to invert it through the human cognitive architecture to get at the underlying motivations for our behavior. So that makes the problem difficult. Okay, so there's a lot of things we could do, um, but I just want to end on some questions. Can we change AI uh, the way we define it? Uh, certainly, I'll do my best uh, in the next edition of the textbook. Um, I want it to be the case that uh, at some point, no one talks about about AI safety as a separate discipline, that every one of you takes seriously, just like a bridge designer takes uh, as intrinsic to the meaning of the word bridge that it doesn't fall down, right? It should be intrinsic to the meaning of the word AI that is beneficial to people. We're not building AI to benefit cockroaches or bacteria. Uh, we're building AI for us, uh, and that's an important thing. Thank you. If anybody has a question, raise your hand. I'll bring the mic back to you, and you can ask it. So give me a second. It's a good workout for me, uh, but here you go. Hi. I wanted to get your thoughts on superintelligence. So there's a theory that we can get there in one of two ways. First, from human brain emulation, or also by just purely improving AI with either cheaper, cheaper chips or more time or more learning. So I wanted to see kind of where, where you stand on that. Uh, good question. So I don't agree with either of those uh, theories of how we're going to get there. Um, I think whole brain emulation, uh, I mean, technically it's possible, but it's incredibly expensive. And it's much less clear what the real benefits are, because you still may not understand the system that you build. And we have plenty of easy ways of building brains um, that we don't understand already, right? Which is the usual biological way of building brains. Um, I absolutely don't agree that making chips faster and collecting more data is the way we're going to achieve human-level AI. Uh, I mean, somewhat tongue-in-cheek, the, the faster your chips, the faster you get the wrong answer. So uh, we really need some conceptual breakthroughs. As I, as I mentioned earlier in the talk, there are several areas where we know that current approaches will not work. Uh, so we need these conceptual breakthroughs. As I pointed out in the case of nuclear physics, those breakthroughs are unpredictable and can occur uh, at any time. So given the amount of brain power being put into this problem right now, uh, the, the main conceptual breakthroughs could happen in fairly rapid succession. So I think the sooner we prepare 
for how we are going to deal with super intelligent machines, the better. But I can't put a timeline on it because it's very hard to predict those breakthroughs. Thanks. Um, so when you're talking about being able to use uncertainty in the goal for an AI to be able to, you know, um, perform its tasks without harming humans, well, humans themselves are incredibly uncertain about what the goal is and what other people want out of your own actions. Uh, you know, it's like a Dunning-Kruger effect. You know, you're incompetent but unaware of that incompetency. So there's no reason to assume that AIs couldn't suffer from a similar um, problem and just decide that, hey, even though I'm uncertain, I'm certain that this is going to be my action and the action can be detrimental. So how can uncertainty really be a true safety net for beneficial AI? Okay, so... Um, well, that's, that's, a, that's a great question, and it's, it's, that's a complicated set of issues around this. Probably the first issue is, uh, what if humans really don't have objectives at all? So it can easily be the case that a human might be uncertain about what is my immediate goal, right? But do the following thought experiment, right? Suppose I had a way of showing you in some compressed, uh, speeded up form, uh, two future lives for you, for yourself, and you know, for the rest of the world that you care about. And you could watch these two movies uh, and then decide wh you know, which is the one you, you like best. Right? I think, roughly speaking, it, it's a reasonable question to say, yes, I could express a preference, or I could say, well, they're about the same. Right? And so that's all we require for this theory to be correct, right? is that, that you that you have some way of, of preferring one life over another. Right? So even though you might not be sure which is, which is the sub-goal I should work on now. So human goals, you should always really think of them as sub-goals. Right? There's a complicated process of, of reasoning that you have to go through to arrive at a sub-goal. Uh, and that process may operate against a background that you can't make explicit about what your true long-term objectives really are. But as long as you have a sense that there's, there's a life for yourself and the rest of the world that you prefer or don't prefer, um, then everything goes through correctly. Yes, yes in, in pursuit of the value alignment as well as the understanding of these odd humans, has anybody taken to trying to represent some of the findings of behavioral economics, the Kahneman and, and Tversky types of rules about the biases and so forth of human beings as a way to give a view on human beings and their values versus their actions? Uh, yeah, good question. So um, not really in a, in a formal sense. And uh, there's, there's multiple reasons why it's, it's a little problematic. So one is that the, there's a whole branch of psychology, mainly the evolutionary psychologists, who don't believe any of the Tversky and Kahneman claims about human irrationality. And they argue that, if, it, yes, of course, if you present data in the form of text saying 60% of bank tellers are female, right, and then you ask people to make parabolistic judgments, that doesn't work because text with numbers, you know, six and a zero and a percent sign doesn't engage your built-in parabolistic hardware. Right? But if you present data, if you present data showing lots of bank tellers of, of whom 60% are female, then people make the judgments correctly. So evolutionarily realistic data uh, and decision problems uh, seem to show that humans are much more rational than Tversky and Kahneman would have you believe. Um, also, so Danny Kahneman went through a period when he was trying to figure out, you know, what is the human reward function? Right? And he, he ran experiments. Um, so typically in experiments, you either pay people uh, and that's the, that's the reward that you give them to make decisions in, in experiments. Um, so they're, they're basically betting, uh, and, you, and you have to pay them if, if they bet right. Or uh, you can inflict punishments. And you know, punishments with electric shocks are a little bit passe. Um, so he decided to use uh, plunging your hand into ice water. Uh, uh, and uh, that, that, that kind of works. It's definitely a negative reward. but. But after a while, when he tried to fit all the data that he had, he found that, uh, in fact, people prefer longer periods of immersion in ice water than shorter periods. 
Uh, and at that point, he kind of gave up. He says, I, you know, I give up. Humans are so freaking weird that, <laughs> that uh, it's really impossible to fit what they really do to, to the classical you know, additive reward models. So, so ad I think the real problem is, is additivity in rewards is not correct. That we have some kind of memory thing that makes, makes a max, the ma there's a max term in there, uh, which is really important. So there are other, other experiments on, on colonoscopies. Um, so in colonoscopies, it can be quite unpleasant, so I'm told. Um, so you can have, you know, so you can measure how much pain someone is feeling. So they tell you, to, you know, click, give me the clicker for how much pain you're feeling right now. So you, you measure the pain, and it goes sort of up and up and up and up, and then down and down and down and down over a course of about an hour, I think the whole procedure is. Um, so if you go up and up and up and then stop immediately, that turns out to be worse than going up and up and up and up and then down and down and down and down and down. And down. Right? So there's strictly more total pain uh, in the up and up and up, down and down and down and down. Right? But in fact, you prefer that to the one where you just go up and then stop. Because I think what happens is you remember, the, when you stop immediately, you remember the amount of pain you were experiencing at the, at the end of the procedure. Um, whereas when you tail off gradually, you kind of forgotten the really bad pain. So it's, it's a very complicated thing. But we have to face the fact that, you know, since we're trying to make humans happy and not fungi and bacteria, uh, that we have to get it right. We have to actually reflect real human pr preferences. Yeah. Um, hi, so um, you mentioned that we should always be able to turn off the machine. And obviously, the same doesn't apply for humans, just because I dislike someone's actions. I'm not going to kill them. Do you think there's a line at which point our control over machines might become a form of slavery? Ah, yes. Um, good question. Well. I mean, you're sitting on a chair. The chair is a very simple machine. I don't think you, you worry about the chair's feelings. Um, so it, it, the, the real question is, is, is about subjective experience. You know, at what point do we say the machine is having subjective experience? And I know there are people, for example, who think that, that doing reinforcement learning, uh, where you give negative rewards uh, at any point, is, is inflicting suffering on the, on the machine that's running the reinforcement learning algorithm. Right? There's something wrong with that, because you, you, if, if that was true, right, you could simply shift all the rewards up so they're all positive. You get exactly the same behavior. Uh, right? In fact, it's the same program. Uh, and now there's no suffering happening. So this, I think there's something fishy going on. And um, we have really no theory of what consciousness is or whether, how to distinguish a conscious from an, a completely, you know, a conscious machine from a chair. Uh, so until we do, I think we have to just, I'm afraid, punt on that question. Uh, so when yep. you talked about human values, you implicitly assumed that the entire humanity has the same set of values. No, you know? not well, at all. I mean, there was a slide. There was a slide that said that we're all different. Yeah, there was a slide about heterogeneity of humans. But so we live in this class-based society where certain subset of society has much more powers uh, compared to the rest of the society. And what is good for them is not necessarily good for the rest of the society. Yep. So is there any way, way to deal with that and address this problem? Yeah, so the real issue, and so in, in economists talk about social choice theory and so on. The, the real issue is the fact that when you have a robot or m multiple robots that are serving multiple people, every robot has an obligation to the whole human race. So no one can tell a robot to go and do something that makes someone else unhappy. Uh, and we have, we have laws that, that are supposed to prevent humans from doing that with each other. Um, but how you trade off the preferences of one person with the preferences of another, a priori, I think the right answer is that everyone counts the same. Uh, I can't think of a, a form of legislation that would say anything different from that. Um, the, the problem that comes up when you do that, um, we've called it the Somalia problem. So you come home after a long day, and you look out the window, and you know, the grass is really long, but you have to feed the kids. So you tell the robot to go mow the lawn, and the robot says, we know there are people in Somalia who are suffering. I'm going to go to Somalia and help them, and you can mow your own lawn. 
right? That, that's a, there's a little problem uh, with that. But I, I, I completely agree that um, the, the issue of how we deal with the, the fact that there's more than one person in the world and that there are not infinite resources to make everyone infinitely happy, uh, that's a fundamental one. And AI doesn't have a solution to that. Um, and so we're bringing in a lot of social scientists uh, to join the center and try and come up with uh, solutions. And because it's a Berkeley, you can be sure that the social scientists at Berkeley uh, have the best interests of humanity at heart. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great questions. Um, yep. Thank you for the talk. So, yeah.